And uh, first of all, let me thank uh, Graphic Group and Stambik uh, for the opportunity to invite me and my colleague to come and deliberate on this very, very important topic, uh, looking at uh, our political business cycle and fiscal stability. I think they couldn't have chosen any topic other than this, particularly as we are gearing towards an election year. And also the budget, the last budget for that election is just around the corner. This is for slides. Sorry, yeah. Okay. So, um, what I'm here for before we start the conversation is just to try to put in context, as the, uh, Nick, the MC mentioned, uh, the whole idea, what is the explanation, or what are we actually trying to say. And so I'll just be brief, just about 10 to 15 minutes of presentation, and then we can kickstart our, our discussion, which is, I think, most important. So quickly, just to uh, what is political business, business cycle, uh, we're trying to just understand it, looking at the conceptual framework of political business cycle, um, what is it, why is it a problem for countries like Ghana? Uh, how has it played out in fiscal development and performance? And can it be avoided coming 2020? Are there measures to contain it uh, that we can ensure that government will not uh, renege on its promise? So I'll first look at what the literature says about political business cycle. Uh, the literature has several definitions, and in this particular one, which I'm interested in, it says that it describes a situation where government or political actors stimulate the economy just before or prior to an election year with the main aim or with the intention of increasing or improving the prospects of government or the incumbent government getting re-election. That is quite simple. And this situation is actually not something that can only be found in Ghana. There's enough evidence to show that in many countries they have experienced this kind of phenomenon. Now the underlying framework is actually quite, uh, sometimes you cannot blame government uh, for, for having to overindulge in some of these things. Because, I mean, the economists, or uh, economists often have a view about policy. We have the expansionary policy and then we have the contractionary policies. Now, there's often this short-term trade-off in policies. And this short-term trade-off often comes between economic growth and lower unemployment and inflation. Now, government has a social contract with the people to provide for them social services, public services, road, infrastructure, health, and what have you, to give them jobs or to create an environment where jobs will be created for the people. At the same time, government also has a responsibility to ensure stable macroeconomic environment. Now, these two key objectives in the short term tend to have a trade-off. It's quite inconsistent because if government wants to grow the economy, if government wants to create jobs and reduce unemployment, it has to pursue an expansionary fiscal or monetary policy. Expansionary fiscal or monetary policy. And that is how government can promote the economy. And this can come about by government increasing expenditure or cutting taxes. And the people benefit. So such policies are often very popular with the people because it, it often results in creating of jobs. People get jobs, incomes increase, public services are provided, infrastructure comes on board. And so generally, people would want government to pursue an expansionary fiscal and monetary policy. But in the short term, 
that policy is often is inconsistent with stable and low inflation or rate of inflation. And so while government will be pursuing that, the short-term consequences is that you will end up increasing inflation, and the increasing inflation will have all the other adverse effects on the economy. But in the long term, that can harm the long-term prospect or the growth prospect of the economy, and that would even reverse all the gains that government has intended to achieve. So what does government has to do? If government concern is about macroeconomic stability, then the government has to pursue a more contractionary policy by cutting expenditures, by increasing taxes. And such policies are often also not popular with the people. It's not popular and it can also have political costs for government. Because if government is not spending, it means that government is not going to spend on infrastructure. Our government will have to increase interest uh, taxes and interest rates will have to increase so that government can achieve inflation target. But in the short term, it's not popular with the people because it's not going to create enough job, it's not going to increase or grow the economy. But in the long term, the people tend to benefit largely because it, it is very much consistent with long-term economic growth and much more creation of employment. And therefore, government being rational, the reason why we have this situation, the political business cycle, we've often said that government is a rational being. And for a rational being, it will always prioritize short-term political objectives over the long-term gain, because in short-term matters most to government. And therefore, government is more likely to trade higher inflation or to trade rate of inflation for a very low unemployment or economic growth because of government interest of prioritizing its own short-term gain. So very shortly, this is how the cycle went, that proud to an election year, government has option of pursuing policies, either contractionary policy or expansionary policy. Now, given the fact that government wants to prop or increase its chances of re-election, it, it is more likely to go in for expansionary monetary and fiscal policy, because that is a policy that is popular with the people. And that will mean that government cutting taxes, lowering pursuing policies, expansionary monetary policies that will lower the interest rates. It will mean that government increasing spending on public services, including social spending and infrastructure spending. Now, so these policies are very popular with the people. So it would mean that at the end of the day, government is more likely to win the elections because it would have met its side of the bargain to the people. So the National elections will be held. By then, this situation is likely to have a very adverse consequences because of the expansionary nature of the government policy. And this is likely to throw the economy in instability. We're going to have a high macroeconomic instability, which is higher inflation. Now, the higher inflation will mean that if you are within an inflation targeting framework like we have, then your interest rates have to go up to anchor expectations about uh, pressures on inflation. Then with more money in the economy, it means that you're going to have a very unfavorable trade balance because imports will increase, and that will mean that your currency is also going to depreciate much more. With that, it means that because government has excessively spent, in many cases, way and over its revenue, it is more likely to record very large fiscal deficits. Now, that large fiscal deficit means that government would have to find a way of financing that large fiscal deficit. And that would mean that government would have to resort to borrowing. And the borrowing would, make, would lead to increase in debt stock. There's going to be high debt overhang on government the desktop is going to balloon. And once your desktop balloons, 
what you're going to have is your interest payment is going to increase. So government would have to spend a lot, uh, about a quarter, 30, 40% of your revenue in servicing debt. Now, that debt servicing is a recurrent expenditure, which then means that in the next period, it will be part of your expenditure. So in the next period, you are going to further enlarge your fiscal deficit. And once your fiscal deficit enlarges, you are going to then create much more borrowing, more debt, and then more interest payments. So it becomes more a vicious cycle. And so this situation often will mean that government would have lost some credibility in the process because with this situation, higher inflation and higher interest rate, the economy is going to contract. You're not be able to grow as you expect. You are going to have businesses leaving your economy. And you may even uh, incur huge reputational costs. And you may not have any choice. And for many governments, once they win power, they immediately begin to reverse course because the next election is very far away. And so they immediately will put in much more contractionary policy. That will be much more favorable to government because the election is nowhere near. And if government has lost so much credibility and reputation, they, it may not be able to do it by its own, but rather it will have to go to perhaps IMF. And so at this point, at the contractional monetary policy, it will have to go to the IMF to pursue much more fiscal consolidation policy, okay? Um, much more austerity measures, which often comes with a lot of conditional, conditionalities. And it will mean that government will have to now increase, interest, uh, increase taxes. It will have to cut deep expenditures. And then it will have to make sure that it will pursue much more uh, tighter monetary policy to increase interest rates. So you will see that at the contractionary level, government expenditure will cut, interest rate begins to go up, and then uh, more taxes will be introduced in that regard. So that is what will often happens. And this then creates a cyclical fluctuation between a stimulus situation and then a restrained situation. And this continues. And as soon as another election comes, government will have the same incentive to, uh, and so it becomes a cycle year in, year out. So this is how the whole framework works. Now let's see whether this pertains. Uh, the earlier speaker actually made reference to that. Now, I, I tried to look at fiscal deficit and targets over the last 10 years, where we have had three elections. Now, from 2008, government actually budget a fiscal deficit of about 4%. We ended up with 11.3%, meaning that government pursued much more expansionary monetary and fiscal policy that actually led to higher fiscal deficit. Now, immediately, government reversed course. Immediately, it began to pursue much more contractionary policy. So you see that the, uh, the fiscal deficit began to reduce because we have to run to the IMF immediately afterward. Then another election was getting near. Then government had the same incentive again to spend more. So in 2012, whereas we budget for about 5.3, uh, percent of GDP of deficit, we ended up with 12.1 percent of deficit. The same incentive of expansionary policy, we had inflation actually increasing over 20 percent. We have interest rates going over 30 percent. We have the debt stock increasing, and we have interest payments actually going by about 41 percent of tax revenue. Then, government then have to reverse course again to move to more contractionary policy, and uh, we started declining until 2016 when the similar incentive came back again. And we had to, in fact, these ones are lower figures because we are taking into consideration the rebasing, which is reducing the deficit. Otherwise, it would have been much higher. Without the rebasing, uh, if you are using the same GDP, the 7.8 that was recorded in 2016 would have been 9.4% uh, or thereabout. And so, in 2016, even when we still have the IMF in place, governments still have the 
incentive to pursue much more popular policies that can increase its chances of getting re-elected in government. So we have a similar situation. And immediately after a new government come and you see much more the need to pursue much more contrastionary policy, and so we started declining. Now the key question is, another election is coming, whether government will not have the same incentive to spend more. Now, one underpinning factor for these things happening is largely, or in many cases, the fact that during these election years, government tend to overproject revenue. This issue wouldn't have been a problem if government is able to mobilize enough tax revenue. Because, in fact, when you look at our expenditure to GDP in this country, ours is much more lower than many African or even uh, developed countries. Our tax expenditure to GDP is just about 19 to 20%. But in many countries, uh, expenditure to GDP is 25, 30, 35, 45%, which means that really we are not spending much enough. The key issue is we are not generating enough revenue because our revenue to Domestic revenue to GDP is about 16%. Our tax revenue is 13%. If you compare that to peer countries in the region, it's 17%. In sub-Saharan Africa, 17% tax to GDP revenue. Ours is about 13%. So if government wants to spend more, the only way out is to overproject revenue. So in many cases, government would overproject revenue in this period, so that it gives it much more freedom, fiscal space to spend. So you look at the same election years, and you realize that during those election years, government had overproject revenues much more than the previous years. So in 2012, revenue was deviated much higher. The average deviation from targets is often around 9%. That is, when we do the projection, we are able to, on average, collect just about 90% of the target. But in those election years, particularly in 2012, it was about 20%. In 2016, it was more than 15% over projection. Okay. So the key thing is, at this material moment, the, 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 the expenditure execution grows faster than revenue mobilization. And that often has been the issue, the problem that we have. Yeah. So the knock-on effect has been that if you look at our interest payments, compare that with our compensation, that is wages and salaries, because most of these expenditures often goes into paying wages and salaries, and then also because we have to borrow more, it often leads to increases in our uh, debt obligation, interest payments would increase. So over the years, you've realized that if we compare our compensation, uh, that is wages and salaries and other allowances that are paid to government, uh, uh, civil servants, and others, and then you add statutory payment, that the earmark fund, you realize that when you add the three, uh, to, and we compare that to our domestic revenue, it is almost, in 2016, it was 103%, which means that the three alone is more than the, uh, our total revenue or domestic revenue that we collect. And it's even more severe and much more serious when we compare that with the tax revenue, which is about 130%. In 2018, it was almost 100%. That is the compensation, interest payment, and um, statutory payment. It's almost 100%, meaning that everything that we collect, we have to use it to uh, pay for these three earmark funds. Yes. So the key thing or the key knock-on effect would then be that with that earmark funds going beyond your tax revenue, you often will have very little flexibility to spend on sectors that will generate further economic growth for the country. So growth enhanced expenditures are often uh, crowded out in that regard. So you can see that over the years where we've started recording high fiscal deficits, you see that our expenditure on capital expenditure, or what we often call the CAPES, has been on the decline. Declining at a peak of about 5.4%, and then in 
it has declined now to about 1.6. Why? Because most of the amount, we are now paying about 35% of our domestic revenue in interest payments, settling our interest costs. And the interest cost is really high and it takes more than a quarter of our total expenditure. So it is a problem. The cyclical fluctuation of this um, political business cycle is the reason why this country has not experienced sustained and stable uh, growth over a long period of time. So can it be avoided coming in 2020? Are there enough measures to make sure that government does not take us back to this period? So I'm ending now. So luckily now we have measures that can in a way tie the hands of government to not to overspend. This government has attempted to roll out certain measures and some were also rolled out in the previous government. We now have strict adherence to a fiscal responsibility act which actually attempt to put a cap on a fiscal deficit not for it to be more than 5% of GDP. So which means that government is now restricted not to exceed or overexpend uh, to a deficit of 5%. There's also now the PFM, the Public Financial Management Act, which actually uh, uh, seeks to promote efficient and effective public financial management. Um, the, we now have a, a very strict enforcement of the Public Procurement Act to promote efficiency in public spending, thereby promoting value for money. And then also we have the Fiscal Advisory Council, the Presidential Fiscal Advisory Council, which were not there before. Uh, the main aim is for it to serve as a watchdog uh, for prudent fiscal management. And then also one of the key corporate for uh, macroeconomic instability over the years is the central bank financing of government deficits. And now we have that being eliminated and government committing itself to a zero central bank financing arrangement, which means that uh, the central bank can no longer finance government deficit. And that is very positive to rein in on inflation. So while these are very important policy measures and research has shown that these actually promote the incentive for government to actually pursue uh, much more sound fiscal policies, uh, policies that will have a long-term uh, effect, uh, sustainability on fiscal performance, I would say that it is not a silver bullet. These policies alone are not silver bullet to ensure long-term fiscal sustainability. It will require strong adherence of high-level or and high-level political commitment. Anything short of that will render all these policies useless because we've seen that before. Even when the IMF was in place, we were still able to overspend. So it will require government being very disciplined, committing itself to the rules of the game, and ensuring that it rein in all its agencies not to do any off-budget expenditures. It is key. The final one has also been the people, the electorate. More often than not, they are also, in my view, to be blamed for what we often experience. There's often too much pressure on government, particularly getting to the end or the run up to an election where communities, organized labor and others try to hold government to ransom, to bargain for, I mean, to get a big chunk of the, of the kick at when election is getting nearer. And I would say that given what we have experienced, I think that the populace and then the electorate can moderate or should moderate their expectations, not to bring undue pressure on government and allow government to execute the budget as it's been defined. And if that happens, I'm sure that we will uh, have uh, this time a good uh, uh, budget and a very disciplined election year. Thank you very much.